Great, and welcome everybody to uh, this uh, last of our series of uh, presentations on the uh, the Waste Five. And today we're going to be highlighting the clinical subgroups, uh, special group studies that were a part of the standardization process. So, just uh, as we dive into this, a quick overview. Hold on a sec here; it's not advancing. Uh -oh. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Let's see if it advances. Uh oh, it's not advancing. Uh, there we go. Okay, that took longer than I thought. Sorry, folks. So, just a real quick update: some of the new at, new um, features of the Waste Five is that obviously we wanted to make sure that we hit updated norms that are uh, aligned with uh, the contemporary census of the day. Uh, we also have uh, had the goal of reduced administration time, which is typically when we re-standardize our tools, that's one of the, the top pieces of feedback that we get, uh, that time constraints are always a critical factor. And so we, we really uh, strove for that. Uh, we also have a new test structure that is aligned with the other uh, Weschler products of the WISC and the WISC. And we also added a series of new subtests and um, as in today, as I noted, we're talking about some of the special group studies that were incorporated into our, uh, our norming process. Um, and then we also wanted to make uh, the uh, expand the way so that it has broader clinical utility for the kind of work that uh, we do in our field and an overall improved user experience, which encompasses a, a number of factors, including time, applicability to the clinical uh, uh, the world that we operate in and another a number of other features. And these will all also be highlighted in the manual uh, once the test publishes. Uh, so typically, uh, you know, I think the prior ways, uh, the administration time was approximately 60 minutes. Uh, as you can see, we've uh, we achieved one of our top goals, which was to be able to keep it uh, with, uh, under an hour. So 45 minutes to attain the full scale IQ. Uh, which requires the uh, minimum of seven subtests, but 60 minutes to obtain all five primary index scales, which does require the full 10 subtests. So in this slide, uh, this is just an overview of now the new five factor structure. And as you can see, we um, had uh, broken apart the perceptual reasoning um, or disaggregated the components of perceptual reasoning to, to align it uh, with the, uh, the current structures of the, of the WIPSI and the WISC uh, to include a, a visual spatial um, indice and then also a fluid reasoning indice. Uh, we still have maintained the verbal comprehension, working memory, processing speed. And as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, is that you can also obtain a full-scale IQ using the seven primary uh, subtests that are highlighted in blue. Uh, one caveat is there's only uh, several, several caveats that rather is that only one substitution is permitted when deriving the full scale IQ, which is a change from some of the earlier versions, which I think it allowed up to two. Um, and the other fact, um, important piece of information that is unique to the WASTE 5 is that when you are administering the uh, seven subtests and the 10 um, subtests, uh, uh, scales in order to get the full scale IQ, uh, digit forward must be administered, even though you may not be using it in the indice or in the, sub, in the uh, full scale IQ. And the reason for that is it was, it was administered during, during standardization. While it may not be required for the full scale IQ, it is required to be administered uh, because it was done so during the standardization procedure. So that way, as the examiner, you are being consistent with protocol of the data collection when the test was developed. So that will also be articulated in the manual, but I wanted to, to call that out here as well. And so as you can see then under those five uh, subtests, excuse me, indices uh, of verbal comprehension, visual, spatial, fluid reasoning, and working memory, that each has um, two of the, the, the core subtests that will provide the context of those in indexes. So for verbal comprehension, you will have similarity in vocabulary, visual spatial will be block design um, and visual puzzles. And then fluid reasoning is made of, comprised of matrix reasoning, figure weights, working memory is digit sequencing and running digits, which is new. And then processing speed, which is a uh, prize of coding and symbol search. And again, only one substitution is permitted. And also you want to make sure that you are administering digits forward for the 
um, the, uh, the the 10 subtests, which will give you the, the full five indices. Um, and again, that was per standardization. So uh, the focus of today is really to hone in on special group studies that we did in the standardization process. And so what I have listed here are, in, are the, the groups that we are going to review. Uh, so these are comprised of the intellectually gifted, the intellectual disability groups of mild and moderate, the learning disability groups of specific learning disorders, reading, as well as math. Uh, we looked at an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder condition, autism spectrum, traumatic brain injury, both moderate and severe or severe. Um, then mild cognitive impairment, which is understood to be a, um, a precursor to the early early onset uh, dementia, and then probable dementia of the Alzheimer's type of mild severity. Okay. So, uh, what I've listed here, and this is this is really for the purposes of the presentation today. This this particular slide will not be in your handouts, uh, partly because it's just so uh, so detail to be it doesn't transfer well to the handout but this is available in the manual so when you get the test you'll have this available um, but this is essentially uh just the, the demographics that uh, we use when we were looking at our special group studies um, as you can see uh we have kind of the mean age it is uh, as low as 18 years old 18.4 years old all the way up to uh oh gosh where is it uh 70 78 and that uh, we aligned the uh, similar to the general standardization we aligned it with the census and we, uh, we looked at uh, various factors such as education uh, race and ethnicity and then uh, the, the four regions throughout the united states uh, 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 male and female gender and then uh, when they were tested before covid and then after covid as well and so what i found interesting and this is part of the reason i have this particular slide is that we had started the standardization of the waste prior to COVID and we had collected a sizable amount of data and then COVID put the brakes on everything. And when we do our normating process, we do do that within a certain window of time. And because of the delays of COVID, we were not able to collect all the data in that appropriate window of time. So we had to basically restart. And what that did give us though was a, a, a uh, PPE, we call PPE, personal protective equipment uh, comparison group, which um, um, which will be available in the manual, just kind of minimum information, but it's much more of a reference of, of interest. Okay. So when we look now, when we begin to look at the specific subgroups, we're going to start with intellectually gifted. And uh, what we would anticipate is that folks who are in this category, um, they would have generally higher full scale IQs compared to match controls, and they would have higher scores on multiple indexes compared to match controls. So in our in our norming process, we did uh, some additional analysis, which indicated that uh, as you can see on the right, the following percentages of individuals identified as intellectually gifted and their match control see, received waste five scores uh, of 120 points or higher on the corresponding composite scores. So for example, for full scale IQ, for the giftedness group, we had 82% of them had scores of 120 or higher compared to 5% of, of the comparison groups. Uh, and in the general abilities index, we saw that 82 in the gifted group compared to 10%. Uh, Nonverbal index was 59 compared to 8%. Um, the non-motor index was 82 compared to 8%. And the verbal new the new verbal expanded crystallized index was 77 in the gifted group versus five in the non-gifted group. And then new expanded visual spatial index was 67. Uh, compared to 8%. And then finally, the, extent, the new expanded fluid reasoning index, uh, we saw 69% had scores of 120 or higher uh, versus 8% in the match groups. So when we look at our, our actual data, um, what I've list, listed here in, in, on this group, and I'm not gonna be showing all of the various indices uh, on the other slides, but I wanted to give you kind of a sampling of what will be in the manual. And this particular slide will not be in your handouts, but it will be in the manual. So as you can see, when we look at the five primary indices, in, in, including the full scale IQ, is the giftedness group had significantly higher scores, ranging from 
uh, 127 for the full scale IQ compared to 103 in the match controls. And when we look at the significant values over on the second column from the right, we can see that these are all highly significant um, differences. So the good news is, is that the WACE is sensitive to identifying differences between uh, those who have been uh, determined to be intellectually gifted versus match controls. So we like that sensitivity. So then when we look at the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at folks who have intellectual disability of the mild severity, what we would expect is that we would anticipate lower scores by approximately two standard deviations from the full scale IQ compared to match controls. And we would also anticipate lower scores by probably approximately two standard deviations on multiple indexes compared to match controls. So in our addition, in our follow-up analyses, with the following percentages are what we found was that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when we looked at the, the disability the mild disability group compared to match controls is that uh, they received waste five scores of 75 points or lower. So this is the, the mild um, in, in, impaired group at 75 points or lower um, on the corresponding composite scores. We saw that uh, of that group, 89% had scores 75 or lower compared to 9% match controls. And on the nonverbal index, we saw 87% compared to 5%. And in the non-motor index, we saw 91 to 7%. And when we actually look at the numbers, we see, and remember, I'm not going to show all the indices, but I just wanted to give you a sample of the primary ones. All the data will be available in the manual. Uh, we do see that indeed that did pan out with the, the intellectual disability mild impairment group. Remember, the threshold was 75 or lower. We see them in the 60s range and again uh, compared to match controls we had a high level of significance uh, from this group as we move on to the intellectual disability moderate severity group we would again expect that they would have approximately have three standard deviations uh, um, compared to full uh, in their full scale iq compared to match controls um, and then lower scores by approximately three standard deviations across multiple indexes and so the percentage of individuals that were diagnosed with intellectual disability, moderate severity, and their match controls received scores of 60 points or lower on, on, on the same composites. So the full scale IQ, we saw 75% of them had scores of 60, um, 60 or lower, okay? Uh, whereas we didn't see any of that in match controls. And we saw the same for the nonverbal index and non-motor index as well. So this indicates not only is it way sensitive to differentiate between these groups, but it's also sensitive within groups of disability uh, to help you determine kind of the level of impairment that they may be experiencing. And so again, this is a representation of those uh, uh, means for the, dis the moderate disability group compared to match controls. And again, when we look at the p-values, we see a high level of significant differences. Moving along, uh, so the um, uh, one of the historically one of the primary uses of uh, the Weschler products, particularly the WISC, but also now you know, also the ways for the kind of the older um, teenagers and young adults uh, and college folks is really identifying if they have uh, learning disabilities. And so when we look at the specific learning disorder of reading compared to match controls, what we would expect is this idea of you know, learning disabilities, unlike the um, intellectual disabilities where you have maybe global deficits, we would anticipate that we'd have some areas of deficits, but other areas of typical typicality. So uh, I like the phrase, it's seen uh, specific learning disabilities are best understood as an island of weakness and sea of strength. So we would, we would anticipate variance in scores across some indexes, but not all of them. But we often will, would anticipate lower scores on verbal comprehension because it's a reading, right? Working memory, processing speed, and then full scale IQ compared to match controls. So when we look at the uh, cognitive proficiency index, the mean score has the highest or the largest effect size of any of the indexes, okay? Uh, followed by the auditory working memory index, um, the registration um, side of that, and then the processing speed index. And in each of these means were significantly lower than the, the matched corresponding means to the match control groups. Um, there were other significant differences which occurred in on the verbal expanded crystallized index, the expanded processing speed index, and the reduced motor speed index as well, which produced moderate effect sizes. 
Okay, um, moderate or, or small effect sizes are also present for all of the remaining composite mean scores differences with the exception of the visual spatial index, fluid reasoning, and the, the expanded visual spatial index. Also the visual working memory index, and the nonverbal index, which these all produce neg negligible effects. Uh, among the subtests, there were significantly lower performances in, uh, for the um, SLD reading group uh, that we observed in vocabulary, running digits, which is new, digits forward, coding, and symbol search. The largest effect sizes were noted for the group mean differences for digits forward and vocabulary. Then the mean group differences for running digits, simple search, and coding did show moderate effect size. So while the group mean differences for comprehension, digit backward, and letter number sequencing are not statistically significant, they did show some moderate effect sizes. So this really speaks to some of the, the um, complexities of this uh, particular uh, diagnostic subgroup. Okay, advance my slide here. Okay. Okay, and then um, what we have is uh, the, the corresponding data that was from the uh, standardization group. So while we do see significant differences, particularly in the VCI um, between the SLD reading group and the match controls um, uh, of, of 0.05, uh, they're not as sizable as we would see the intellectually disability group, intellectual disability group, obviously. And then we also see uh, consistent uh, 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 differences between the working memory and the processing speed indexes uh, for, th for this group as well. And this is a, a fairly common finding within the subgroup. When we uh, advance on to the math uh, learning disability group, the expected tested profile would be that you would anticipate comparable scores on the verbal comprehension index and then variance in scores across other indexes where they, where they would be lower on visual spatial, the uh, fluid reasoning, working memory, processing speed, and then full-scale IQ. So when we look at the full-scale IQ, nonverbal index, and, and the non-motor index means for this, the SLD math group, they are highly similar to one. The largest effect sizes were observed with um, across a series of uh, other uh, sub -indi sub supplemental indices, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail just for the sake of time, but those will also be available in and on the manuals when you look at the tests. So <clears throat> what's notable is that all the subtests, at the subtest level, there were several mean subtest scores that are significantly lower in the SLD math group, where we saw the largest effect sizes are observed on arithmetic, which is not a surprise, uh, and coding. Mean differences with moderate effect sizes uh, uh, are present on a number of subtests, which also which were also significantly lower in the uh, SLD math group. So among these, uh, the largest are digit backwards, uh, figure weights, naming speed quantity, digit se sequencing, matrix reasoning, and block design. The letter number sequencing mean differences also showed a moderate effect size for the subgroup. And when we look at the data, uh, standardization data, uh, we see that uh, uh, true to what we anticipated is that the verbal comprehension index remained uh, within kind of the typical range for this group compared to match controls, but that VSI, uh, VRI, uh, working memory, and processing speed were all a bit lower at various levels of significance. So, and in many ways, uh, you know, math disability is in some, some ways a little bit more complex uh, than, than reading. It's kind of one of the takeaways from this because often math not only involves basic calculation skills, but it also involves a level of, of reading capability and comprehension, kind of speed of being able to problem solve, be able to um, hold multiple pieces of information and awareness at the same time. So there's, there's levels of complexity that can compound the struggle with math disability, I think relative to reading disability groups. Moving on to our attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, group, uh, what we would expect is that would, there would not be a lot of variance in scores across primary indexes, and that they would see, we would see comparable scores on visual spatial fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. Um, so the full scale IQ um, and the nonverbal index and the non-motor index means for the ADHD group are all in the average range and are very similar to one another. A significant difference is present between the ADHD group and match controls on the 
auditory working memory index manipulation uh, index only. And then a moderate effect sizes are observed for the mean differences of the expanded working memory uh, index, uh, the visual working memory index, and then the auditory working me memory index manipulation. And small effect sizes were observed on the expanded visual spatial index and then the auditory working memory index registration. And as we proceed to look at the data, what we find is, is that indeed we don't see any significant differences across the primary indices, as well as um, um, all but one of the supplementary indices. Okay. Moving along to the autism spectrum disorder group is that we would expect a testing profile where we would often see comparable, and this is mo moderate, this is not severe autism, autistic groups, uh, moderate to, to mild. Uh, so, so we'd have comp we anticipate comparable scores on verbal comprehension index, visual, spatial, and fluid reasoning, and then some variance in scores across the following indexes of uh, working memory, processing speed, and then full-scale IQ. So most of the composite mean scores of the autism uh, spectrum disorder group are significantly lower than the corresponding means of the match controls. Uh, the full-scale IQ, the nonverbal index and the non-motor index autism group means are within approximately a point or less of each other. We saw that we, we found the largest effect sizes for this the mean differences are observed on the expanded processing speed index, the reduced motor processing speed index, the visual working memory index, the standard processing speed index, the cognitive proficiency index, and then the, ex the expanded working memory index. We saw moderate effect sizes uh, were present for the mean differences of the working memory index, full-scale IQ, verbal expanded crystallized index, verbal reasoning index, expanded visual spatial index, expanded fluid index, quantitative reasoning index, and auditory working memory manipulation, the nonverbal index, and the non-motor index. So uh, all these results collectively uh, replicate previous research indicating weak processing speed and working memory performance among autism spectrum disorder groups. And as we advance to look at the data, uh, as you can see, we find that the VCI, VSI, and FRI are comparable to the um, uh, match controls, whereas we do see uh, uh, the working memory and processing speed index of the primary scales recall out the differences. And then, as I mentioned, a, a, a number of the supplemental scales, which I don't have re recorded here, but which are available in the manual. When we look at the traumatic brain injury group, uh, what we would expect to see is lower scores by approximately one standard deviation on full scale IQ compared to batch controls, and then lower scores by approximately one standard deviation on multiple indexes compared to match controls. So the, uh, what we found was that the group mean differences are significant for almost all the composite scores uh, with this group compared to match controls, where we found the largest effect sizes for the group mean differences are pre uh, present for the expanded working memory index, the reduced motor processing speed index, the auditory working memory index, the expanded processing speed index, the cognitive proficiency index, and then working memory index. Uh, the uh, traumatic brain uh, injury group means for the full scale uh, and the nonverbal index and the non-motor index are within a few points of each other. So they hover next to each, close to each other. Uh, there were significant differences, though, which all show large effect sizes that were observed between the group means of all the ancillary index scores, which will, uh, will, which will be in the manual, and then the full scale IQ. At the subtest level, the largest effect sizes for the TBI group are observed on letter number sequencing, naming speed quantity, spatial addition, and digit, sequence, digit sequencing, and then running digits. And I have the data represented here. And again, uh, as you can see, we have uh, sizable differences between the means of the group across the primary indexes and the match controls. So uh, again, demonstrating the uh, sensitivity of the waste um, five uh, in uh, calling out those differences. And then the final two groups, uh, the first of mild cognitive impairment, uh, what we'd expect is that there would be comparable scores on verbal comprehension, visual, spatial, fluid reasoning, and working memory indexes. 
and then some variance in scores across uh, processing speed index and then full scale IQ. Uh, processing speed is often uh, considered one of those early indicators that be, uh, begins to demonstrate some compromised um, functioning. So with the MCI crew, uh, we did look at college educated individuals uh, in larger proportions uh, than in the normative, the broader normative sample. The mean composite scores for this group are in the average range. Uh, the group means for the full scale IQ, nonverbal index, non and non-motor index are almost identical. Several composite mean scores for this group were significantly lower than the match control. Among the moderate effect sizes, the largest were with the auditory working memory index manipulation, the nonverbal index, the full scale IQ, the visual working memory index, and then the expanded working memory index as well. Um, also the cognitive proficiency index and then the general processing speed index. Uh, the mean differences were significantly um, statistical, excuse me, statistically significant uh, for a number of subtests that tap working memory, reasoning, and processing speed. At the subtest level, a large effect size was present for symbol span, and then a moderate effect size was observed for similarities, matrix reasoning, digit sequencing, letter number sequencing, coding, and symbol search. <clears throat> okay, Francis. And so, uh, as you can see, uh, the the uh, the canary in the coal mine for the MCI group, mild cognitive impairment, uh, will be in the processing speed realm for the primary index. But then I noted a number of the supplemental indexes, which aren't recorded here, but are in the manual, as well as some of those other subtests. And then finally, dementia of the Alzheimer's type compared to the match controls is uh, we would anticipate lower scores by approximately one standard deviation on all the multiple on multiple primary indexes compared to match controls. Uh, full scale IQ, uh, the um, AVSI and the WMI compared to match controls as well. So when we look at this group, there are we did see significantly lower uh, scores than the corresponding means with their match controls, um, with the exception of auditory working memory uh, registration. The Alzheimer's group means for uh, for the full scale IQ, the nonverbal index, the nonmotor, and the nonmotor index are all within a few points of one another. Almost all effect sizes for the mean composite scores were different or large, with the largest effect sizes noted on the expanded visual spatial index, the visual working memory index, the non-motor, excuse me, the non-verbal index, and the processing speed index, the visual spatial index, the verbal reasoning index, the expanded and the expanded fluid reasoning index. At the subtest level, the Alzheimer's group scored significantly lower than the match controls on most subtests, where we saw the largest effect sizes for the mean scaled scores differences were obtained for symbol search, symbol span, visual puzzles, uh, matrix reasoning, and set relations. And again, here is the data demonstrating some of those differences. Um, all right, that was a quick, quick overview of some of the clinical groups. The uh, at the end of the day, we find that there's sensitivity uh, to being able to identify differences between these, these uh, comparison groups. Thank you, questions? Yeah, great, Pat. I know we just have one minute left, so I'll, I'll throw in <laughs> one quick question and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. But the most common question I think I got was, uh, can they run the discrepancy analysis with the WACE and the WIANT? Yes. Um, and will that be available for customers? Yes, that was not available in the prior version, but for those who are doing um, a disability, excuse me, learning disability evaluations in reading, writing, math, that uh, that was, uh, it's a feature of the of the Waste Wyatt uh, relationship that you can do a pattern to strengths and weaknesses analysis, uh, as well as a kind of the standard discrepancy analysis, which, whichever approach you're, you're using. So that is uh, now an added in feature, which is very good. So great. All right. I know we are out of time. Um, so I want to just thank you, Pat, for sharing all this information. I think people were really interested in all this data that you had to share. Thank you, everyone, for attending today and for your interest in the WACE 5 and for sticking with us through this, this series of webinars. Um, stay tuned. We'll have more webinars available um, around the time of the launch this fall. Um, and just appreciate everybody's interest and, and, and their time that they spent joining us today on this topic. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.